Hello again, this is Bruce Wallenberg, and the next two lectures um, are on generation with limited energy supply. Uh, this is the part one of that lecture series where we take up gas take or pay contracts and coal plant scheduling using linear programming. The part two the limited energy supply is water for hydroelectric, and we're going to talk a, a briefly about hydro scheduling. Both of these topics are very complex. Um, they involve uh, a great many policy issues. Um, particularly hydro scheduling involves policy issues such as who gets the right to use water? I uh, <laughs> legislatures and uh, political bodies argue over that uh, for decades and decades and they work out you know who, who gets the water do farmers get the water for irrigation do people who want to use rivers for navigation to, to run barges and boats up and down the river do they get to use the water um, and uh, does the power company uh, what what rights do they have to the water so it's it's a very contentious issue similarly for fuel uh, scheduling but it's a it's a topic that uh, is very important uh, so that you you schedule the the, uh, the the use of fuels both fossil fuel and let's say hydroelectric fuel if you will uh, to minimize the overall operation of the the cost of operation of the system so here we've we've shown uh, um, two uh, examples here. Here's a here's oil coming into a pipeline and it, and it and it fills this uh, this tank. Uh, so we've got so much oil in the in the tank, and then we're going to draw it back down and run it into the power plant. So we've got oil that's coming in and oil that's coming out. Well, we don't we can't run the the, the tank down to zero. If we do, then then we have a problem of uh, we just get to use what's coming in the pipeline if there's any coming at when we want it, and we can't fill the tank beyond its capacity. So there's a there's a storage uh, issue here. Okay, there's a delivery issue through the through the pipeline. Uh, you could say that you have a similar thing with natural gas, where you have natural gas, only in order to store it, they 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 pump the natural gas into a you could I'll draw it as a cylinder here but it 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 uh, it could be a, a, a facility underground and then pump it back from the underground facility uh, this underground facility is usually like an abandoned mine where they can seal it off they can seal off all of the exits and uh, then just putting put pipes in and out of it so that they can pressurize it it's got to be deep underground so that the pressure doesn't uh, push uh, ground push the the earth uh, and the rocks up and uh, they can put quite a bit of gas gas can be compressed so they put it into this this chamber and then they they bring it back out that's a that's a storage for natural gas but it has the same issues as it would for oil in a tank like this now hydroelectric uh, we've got water coming in inflow so to speak there's a river that's bringing inflow and there's a certain volume of water this is this is this represents the reservoir uh, here we can we can sort of uh, shade that in a little bit there's the reservoir if I fill the reservoir too much the water spills we don't get it to generate but otherwise it generates and an amount Q comes out of the the hydroelectric plant and flows into the next one. Very, very typically, people build uh, hydroelectric facilities in series so that you have one way up in the mountains, then you have another one further down, and another one further down, and so forth, so that you, you generate and you have more storage, and you generate again, then you generate again. Um, and you may have other tributaries kind of flowing into this but here's a river anyway that has three hydroelectric plants on it so the beginning here we're going to talk about uh, what is called a take or pay gas contract take or pay um, we purchase a specific number of cubic feet that's the the key 
we call up the gas company and we say I want so many million cubic feet for example and they quote me a price and if I take it then I I have a contract that says I have to take that many cubic feet and I've, I'm going to pay this price and the contract specifies a time period that it's to be taken so I might I might purchase a certain number of cubic feet and I have 24 hours to use it up now if I don't use it if I only use half of it the gas company says okay and at the end of the 24 hours the gas that I didn't use is no longer mine I don't have any right to it the gas company now is free to sell that to anybody else or sell it to me again but that is uh, it, it is is the gas companies I didn't use it and the contract said I had 24 hours if I didn't use the gas in 24 hours too bad <laughs> that's the way the contract is written uh, and they they do these they, they do these contracts because this this is the way that it makes it easier it makes it possible for the gas company to set up their production and their movement of gas around their system they have to know how much cubic feet and what particular time periods I can schedule it out for a week or a month or something like that but I have to I have to agree on the time period so so once again there's a there's a cubic feet and there's a time period if I don't take it the re, the unused gas remains with the seller there's no refund um, if on the other hand I use up all my cubic feet before the end of the time period that's fine then at that point the gas company says okay your cubic feet are you you've you've used up your contract amount and closes the valve that's it now unless I have another contract right away that's coming on I'm not getting any more gas from that particular gas company incidentally um, some power plants in the in the in the US partic particularly I, I worked on a system in um, in Houston um, the, for Houston Lighting and Power they had gas uh, lines coming from multiple gas suppliers that they could tap into for their power plants so they could schedule gas from from uh, two or three different gas suppliers um, there's quite a network of underground gas pipeline supplies uh, throughout especially along the, the uh, US Gulf Coast and it extends up into the uh, to the northern parts of our country as well as well as coming down into the to the northern part from Canada okay um, once again you pay a fixed amount you get so many cubic feet if you don't use it by the end of the time period you lose it uh, if you use it up before the end of the time period that's it it gets it, that contract is all over and you don't get any more for that for that guy that amount okay here's here's my um, my example now I have n generators over here which are just conventional steam-powered plants they might be coal oil uh, even natural gas that 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 uh, but we're worrying here about the T unit is my take or pay unit and all of these are going to supply a load we don't, we're not drawing the transmission system in just just a single bus so I have n units that are not take or pay and then I have this T unit that's the the take or pay unit and I have PIJ the power from from the unit I during time interval J and then I have FIJ is the the dollar per hour cost for operating the ith unit during the jth time interval here's here's the, uh, the the take or pay unit notice that it's it's got a variable T and J it's that's the fuel input for for my take or pay unit during the J interval and it, it has a a cost which I'm basically later on going to throw out because the, the the fuel is just a fixed price and it it doesn't matter what uh, uh, I'm not looking at the end of you know how much that unit is actually costing me I'm, I'm looking at the fuel cost finally I have a load for every hour every time period J 
this is a throughout the course throughout the textbook um, we we emphasize the fact that time periods can be more than one hour long um, we didn't do this in unit commitment but it's typical for these these hydro and fuel scheduling programs sometimes um, we do not wish to have uh, a a fuel scheduling problem that has 24 hours in it. Um, we would we would rather uh, schedule it in four hour blocks, so n could equal four, and then I just have six time periods. That's one of the reasons that we use the the variable j up here, and we said time interval rather than the the letter t for time, which indicates hours. At least it does to. Uh, to me and to to my co-authors, so we use J here, and so it so if if n were four and I were doing at four hours per time interval, and I, then I had, and I had six of those. Well, then there's 24 hours, but I only have um, uh, six time periods to worry about. Six six periods of four hours each, and that's a very common way to to uh, to solve these problems. Makes makes it so you can solve the problem in a reasonable time and get reasonably close to the to the answer that you need. Um, so the time the time step goes j equals 1 to j max, okay? Here's my my uh, my j equals 1 in in this case I said okay, I'm going to do 12 hours and I'm going to say n equals 1. Okay? So I have uh, and and in here let's say I have 11 hours. So I have I have this period and the load the load goes up like this. It's a constant load for each time period. So my optimization says I'm going to minimize for all of the non uh, take or pay units. I'm going to minimize from 1 to J max the number of hours times the F, which is the dollars per hour. So I'm, I've scheduled each generating unit, multiply it by n, and I add over all those generators, and then I do that finally for the take or pay unit. And if you're thinking about this, you say, well, this is the cost of operating the J unit. If if I were using the fuel in a normal economic dispatch, but I've already paid for the fuel sort of on the side. I have a fixed contract. So later on, you'll see that this term just goes, okay? I have a loading, uh, pardon me, this this is my load, my load functions down here, but I have a, a gas consumption constraint, and it says that the Q, that's a function of the, the power output of the T unit times N, minus the Q total. This is the amount of the, this is the contract right here. That's the contract. So it's, it's, it's very, very important. We'll put an asterisk. There. That's the contract amount. And it says multiple over the, the whole time periods, NJ times QT. It might be zero for some time periods, but the whole sum should exactly equal QT. I can't go over the gas company. If, if I try to use more, we'll, we'll close its valves. And if I use less, well, that's that. It turns out that if you use less, you've you've given money to the to the gas supplier, and you you haven't gotten gas, so you 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 have to make that energy up some other way. So it's much. You do want to use what you contracted for, <laughs> okay? So this is the the fixed amount of gas. Then I have a loading constraint that for each time period, P load is uh, balanced by the PIJ for every generator that's not the T of P plus the TP unit here. So the sum of all those equals the load. And I put my, 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 my Lagrangian equation and notice that this, this N variable comes out here. So here's the objective N over all of the non-take or pay units and where, where is the take or pay unit? Well, it's because it's, it's, uh, its cost is fixed. I don't put it in the problem anymore. Then I have a Lagrange variable, lambda, times my loading constraint for every time period. 
And then I have another Lagrange variable, a single one. It doesn't have a T variable called gamma, okay? This is the Greek gamma. And that variable is a Lagrange multiplier, but it's the one that's controlling this uh, gas consumption constraint out here, the gamma uh, Lagrange multiplier. So this is the standard Lagrange multiplier that comes out with the units of uh, dollars per megawatt hour. We're going to see here what, what, what this one uh, actually comes out to be. It's very interesting. If I take derivative of L with respect to PIK and set it equal to zero, then it says that N times the derivative, the, the incremental cost or marginal cost, is equal to lambda uh, for each, each hour. Standard economic dispatch. If I do it for the T unit, okay, I got to do it for the T unit, I still get this minus lambda K, but now the T unit comes out over here, and it turns out that the DQ, the Q, the amount of gas being used by the take or pay unit, I take the derivative and I get DQ DP. Well, in order to make this function uh, work out, then gamma has units dollars per ton, or let's go for the natural gas. I could use this method for scheduling coal or oil, but we're, we're dealing with natural gas. What does that look like? Dollars per cubic feet. That's a fuel cost, a fuel price, if you will, a fuel price. And so the gamma serves as a fuel price. It's often called a shadow cost. So here's how we solve this um, problem. We, we start out, we, we give ourselves an initial value for gamma, and we fix it. Well, once I've done that, then I can just do my standard economic dispatch for every unit, including the T unit, calculate to see am I above or below the, the gas consumption uh, rate. And remember, this, this one is, is scheduling for the P load at each, at each time. So I go over all time intervals here, and then I look at this Q constraint. So here's what I'm looking at the contract. Here is the contract here. And I need to know, did I meet the contract or not? And if not, I have to do something. Well, this ought not to be hard to figure out that, that suppose I use too much gas. Remember I said gamma looked like a, fall, a, a, a false fuel price. So if, I, if I'm using too much gas, all I have to do is raise the value of gamma. So if this thing is telling me epsilon is the, the amount of gas used minus the total, well, if I'm not using enough, then this is a negative number. Anytime this is negative, raise the gamma, and now you'll use less of it. it the economic dispatch makes the gas unit look less economic against all the other units. So I've raised the value of gamma. And now perhaps um, I'm not using enough. So now it's positive. Well, now I adjust it back. And so by, by adjusting this up and down, I can come up with a value of gamma that will give me close to zero for the uh, contract uh, error, and I, that's what I want. I want epsilon to be to be close to zero. So here's a, an example. I have a gas-fired plant. Here's the H, uh, the, the uh, heat rate function, MBTU per hour. Uh, fuel cost for the gas is two dollars per cubic, er, for, for thousand cubic foot. CCF is, is one thousand cubic feet. Uh, the gas is rated at a thousand BTU per cubic foot. Here's the P, P upper and lower limits. Um, here's a composite curve for the remaining uh, units. The gas contract calls us to burn 40 million cubic feet of gas. Okay, 40 million cubic feet of gas. The gas contract cost, we're going to say, is eight, $80,000. 
And we're going to use six four-hour periods. This is what I was talking about uh, earlier. We don't, we're not going to use 24 time periods. We're going to use six four-hour time periods. So here's the loads. So for these are the time periods one through six. The load, 400, 650, eight, then it drops back to five, then way down to two and back up a little to three. So that's the load. There's a load for each hour, each time period, pardon me, over 24 hours. Um, and we, we work out the optimum economic schedule with the gas constraints ignored. And if I did that, the T unit would use 21.8 million cubic feet of gas. Now my, my contract, I wanted to burn 40 million, okay? So if I just piped the gas in and said, put the gas on at, at a certain price, I wouldn't use enough. The, the gas uh, supplier, I wanted to use more. So then I went and I made the gas constraint met, and you'll notice that I'm burning a lot more from this one and a lot less from the other units here. So I'm burning more over these units to get to that 40 million uh, cubic feet of, of gas. Um, another method of scheduling is linear programming. Linear programming we can, we can model, as, as we're going to see in this very simple example, we can model some very, very uh, complex processes of transportation and fuel delivery and fuel storage. And um, large, large uh, electric companies with large groups of generators um, will be scheduling uh, coal fuel and oil and gas over long periods of time uh, in order to get the best mix and the best overall economy for all of their generators. And uh, linear programming is the ideal tool to use uh, for that process. Um, we're going to give this, we're going to say that there's a, there's a linear cost function for each generator. The load curves, again, are in blocks. They can be multiple hours like we do, uh, we just did. Fuel delivery to generating plant meets a schedule. The fuel storage volume, we're going to have a storage volume at each plant. The, the volume of storage at the beginning is specified. Volume can be specified at the end, or you can leave it uh, open-ended just to, to get the minimum cost and see where the, as long as the volume doesn't go below zero. We can't have negative volume, and we can't go above the maximum volume, and uh, it, the volume is limited at each plant. So here's my problem. Um, I have a coal mine here, and out of the coal mine comes this, this train. Now here's my my train now. Okay, uh, this is this is a little bit of a retro uh, uh, representation since this is showing <laughs> a little steam engine, um, but um, nonetheless we're we're having a, a train. Um, those of you that 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 uh, know this business and all, you know that that coal is delivered by trains, long what they call unit trains, where all of the cars are hopper cars that deliver coal. And they deliver it from the mine to the power plants. They, they grind it up to a certain degree at the mine so that it flows into the hopper car uh, and then back out of it when they, when they want to. Um, they pull them with diesel engines, not little steam engines like we have here. But nonetheless, this, I thought this was cute, so we put this in the tire. And the train, in this case, comes down the track and it comes to power plant number one. See, here's, here's plant number one. We'll put a big one here. And here's plant number two. So it goes to plant number one and there's just so much coal on, and we want to use all the coal on the train. And so we unload from the unloader here, which takes it out of the hopper car, a certain amount of coal onto the coal pile. So this is the pile. This represents the, the coal pile here. Here's the coal pile. Here's my coal pile. And then the coal goes into the power plant. And when it's operating, we get some, some uh, effluent out of the uh, 
chimney and we get electric power out of it. And so the electric power goes into supplying the load. Then the train goes over here where it unloads the remainder of the coal onto this plant's coal pile and then the train returns to the mine. Now the train is going to make this trip once per week. Once per week uh, it's going to deliver coal from the mine to, to one plant to the next plant. By the way, again, the, the trains, these trains are very, very long. Um, I've seen them, they're, they're you, you, you just, I, I haven't been able to, but, but they go, they go forever. And they're all hopper cars, all of which are full of coal. Um, so here's my load, and I, what I did, we broke this problem down to load is, is just a certain uh, 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 megawatts over each week. We're going to supply a fixed megawatts, 1,200, then 1,500, then 800, over three different weeks. Here are the generators. The, the unit number one can go up to 600. Number two can go to 1,000. Here's my, uh, my linear, my heat rate, and my heat input at max. So that translates to some linear functions for the H uh, function. And there is the dollars per week uh, as a function of P. See, it's a linear function for each generator. Here is the tons of coal. These are all worked out in the text. You, you should go back over. I've, I've skipped a lot of the development of the equations here. Here is the tons of coal as a function of P uh, for, each, for each power plant. Um, there's my loading constraints, P1 and 2. P1 of 1, 2 of 1. Now, the parentheses is the time, the time step inside there. I didn't do this with, with sub and superscripts, but they're inside these parentheses. So I have three loading constraints. Here's my coal delivery. I'm going to deliver 40,000 tons of coal every week, D1 plus D2, D1 plus D2, and so forth. Um, the volume plus delivery minus generation equals the volume at the start of the next hour. Okay, so this says here's the volume of coal at the beginning of hour one. Um, uh, pardon me. Uh, the, the, yeah, and this is the delivery that I get during the time period one, and this is the amount that I extract to burn, and this tells me how much coal I have left at the beginning of, of hour number two. Now that, that number comes back down and gets plugged into that equation. And so this again for plant one, starting at number hour two, plus the delivery to two, minus the amount that I burn, gives me three, and that one comes around over here, etc. So we get two uh, different plants over three time periods. So we have six equations for the for the volume. And again, we can put maximum and minimum on the V so that we can say if uh, if a, if if we want what happens if there's a there's a, a maximum on the volume of the coal pile. It just can't get bigger than a certain amount. Um, then we combined all of the linear equations, and we got we got all of these linear equations. This includes the delivery uh, equations as well as these uh, these um, coal pile volume constraints, and we put all of this into our old linear program. We have we have these we have eighteen variables. For the first hour, we have a D1, a P1, a D2, and P2. For the second hour, I have V1, D1, P1, P2, and D2 and P2. So I, I have all of these. Now, why didn't I have um, um, well, and, and similarly for 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 this hour, we have the the three uh, uh, variables over here. Um, the, the, the point is that there's no um, V11 is the time is the value that we start with. So they're not variables. Okay, so so V1, uh, 
of one. Remember, that's the volume at the start of, of one, and the same thing with V2 of one. Those are, those are given. Now, I can change the problem. I can say, okay, the, the two piles start out um, with, let's say, one half the capacity at each one. Or maybe they start out at zero. Or maybe one of them is, is, is at capacity and the other one is at zero, whatever. But once I give those values, then they're not variables anymore. But the volume in the, at the end of the second hour and the end of the third and the end of the, I'm, I'm sorry, this is the beginning. So this is the beginning volume two, beginning volume three. Here is the beginning volume four. So these, these are the final, okay? These are the final, um, those are the final volumes here, and we we can uh, we can specify those if if you wish. Uh, we can say they have to be no no greater or less, or I could set them as fixed numbers. Maybe I could say I want I want both both piles to be uh, uh, at half half capacity. Whatever. Here are the the linear constraints on the right hand side. So here's all of my all of my constraints inside this this LP and here we have the variables the variables th this is one of those LPs where you want to do it with um, <coughs> upper bounding so each variable has a minimum and a maximum minimum and maximum all the way across and the the maximums here uh, 20,000 in this particular initial problem were the, the maximum number of tons that could be stored in the coal pile and it could go to zero. So zero to 20,000 represented the, uh, the coal pile. And so here's the LP solution for the, the problem that we initially set up. And um, it, it's the, 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 P, the number two unit, we run at 1,000 megawatts, right at its max, both, both uh, the first two time periods. We gradually build up. We also run the second, the first unit at 200, 500, and 150. And um, the deliveries, we put all the delivery um, into the plant number two in the first two weeks. We put all 40,000. We don't deliver anything here. Well, the volume one drops from 70 to 55 to 22. V2 started out at 70, but we delivered 40, but we're burning an awful lot. So we burned more than we brought, and we dropped it down to 46 and 22. And uh, we end up uh, at, with those, uh, I, it doesn't show the V2 ending, but here's the V1 at the end. And that's the minimum cost. So the, the optimum operation was deliver nothing during the first two weeks to number one, just just run it, but it doesn't run as hard as it could. Run number two as hard as it can, 1,000 at its max. Okay, that's the optimal schedule. Thank you very much.